Greetings, nerds. Welcome to March. Uh, two episodes uh, ago of ATP, we talked about crystals, and I told you crystals are really awesome because they're highly stable things that uh, are highly stable. Uh, but problem with a crystal is if you need a clock frequency or a radio frequency that's higher than about 300 megahertz, you can't do it with a crystal. You got to go to something else called a phase lock loop, PLL. Now, what a phase lock loop is, is a circuit topology that takes an input reference frequency, generally from something that is highly stable, um, and converts it into a frequency which is much, much higher, okay? Then it has a feedback thing and it compares the two phases and frequencies and makes sure they're exactly the same, yada, yada, yada. And I'll tell you about how this is gonna work. Um, now, the reason they're so cool, besides that you can get a higher frequency, is that oftentimes they are programmable and they lend themselves to things like, oh, I don't know, a spread spectrum RF. We use that everywhere, don't we? It's in Wi-Fi, it's in Bluetooth, it's in all of your favorite wireless communication modes. Um, we use it for clock generation in, um, in, in, in computers and, and everything. Uh, you can use it for RFD modulation. It, it's found a host of different places. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about history, but before we do, a uh, little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, only because, uh, it's the same shtick I always say, this is a huge topic. I'm, sh I'm, I'm gonna try to cover as much of this as I can to make it useful information to you. But it's a huge topic. Um, when you get into the nitty gritty of designing a phase lock loop, uh, it can get real sticky real fast. And there's no way I'm gonna be able to get you qualified to design something really involved in 20-ish minutes, 30 if I keep rambling like this. So let's get on with the history, folks. Um, start out, now, um, it had been recognized like way, way back uh, that with loosely coupled oscillatory uh, uh, devices, um, they would kind of become sympathetic and start resonating at the same frequency, okay? So that goes way back. But um, in, in, in practically speaking, in about the 1930s, uh, British researchers, in their effort to develop an alternate RF receiver to Edwin Armstrong's, one of my personal heroes, uh, to his super heterodyne receiver. Uh, they wanted something a little more simplistic, so they were developing something that was like a single conversion rather than a dual conversion. What they were doing, uh, it, it seemed like they developed the, the, the idea of a phase lock loop a little bit by accident because they were, they were trying to correct, they, they added a correcting signal to their local oscillator, which drifted a whole bunch, you know, like that in an RF circuit. So, so they had something akin to a phase lock loop in operation. But in 1932, and I'm going to mispronounce this name, I'm really sorry if you're French, Henry D. de Belisquies, skis, just like saying skis, um, he wrote it up in a paper and he is credited with the actual idea of a phase lock loop. Um, and then uh, it had been implemented in a variety of uh, TVs and other RF stuff up until about 1969 when Signetics made it a monolithic endeavor, okay? So these, ever since about 1969, you don't really make phase lock loops out of discrete components. That's nuts. You don't do it. Um, but we'll talk more about the components involved, yada, yada, yada. Um, but that takes us up to today, 1969 to today. Uh, and now let's talk about what the topology actually looks like and some of the design philosophies behind it. So this is the overarching idea behind what a phase lock loop actually is. This is the circuit topology in block diagram form. Now you guys out there who know this stuff inside and out, bear with me. It might seem a little disjointed at first, but I'm gonna try to cover everything-ish. So going into this, you have a reference frequency, this, is probably from your crystal, right? So your crystal, and it goes there. Um, now what happens is you've got, your first stage is a phase detector. Um, and what it is doing, it is, is comparing your input frequency to your ultimate output frequency, all right? Um, with a caveat, we'll describe that as we go. Um, now in comparing these two, it generates an output signal that acts as a correcting signal 
to a voltage controlled oscillator. But between those two things you have a low pass filter, an integrator. And the reason is because um, when you're generating an output signal, whatever that output signal looks like, you want to be careful so as to not overshoot, right? You're trying to, you're trying to correct the frequency, not correct it really, really fast so that you're going to get a high and a low and a high and a low and it'll start to oscillate. So you've got a low pass filter in here for your correcting signal. Now, this guy goes to the voltage controlled oscillator which generates a frequency and then ultimately becomes your uh, F out, okay? And then a portion of the F out gets pumped back to the phase detector, okay? That's overall. Now, obvious questions. First of all, why, why don't we just, if this is a voltage controlled oscillator, why don't we just use that and give it a voltage where we want our frequency and call it good? Well, the reason is because these things are not stable. This thing, really stable. So we want to be able to get the stability from this, but be able to do lots and lots of things with it, okay? So that's why we don't just run a voltage controlled oscillator. Now, the other question, which uh, hopefully is occurring to you if you haven't had any experience with phase lock loops is, what good is it to take the output frequency, which is exactly the same as the input frequency, and compare those? Why aren't you just using the... Okay, well the object is to get a higher frequency, or many other higher frequencies. And that's not usually a full thing. Usually you'll get something in here, which is one over n. So you're actually generating a higher frequency and then dividing it down and then comparing. It is essential that these two frequencies and phases are exactly the same, right? I mean, if you think about it, you can't really compare if you've got a frequency here and a really long pair. I'm, you're never gonna make that comparison, okay? Um, at least not easily. So these two things have to be necessarily very, very close to each other to make this whole thing work. Uh, and through very clever dividing down with counters, we can do all sorts of wacky things. Now before we dig in a little deeper to each of these stages, let me talk about uh, what's available in terms of a phase lock loop. So if you go, if you go to DigiKey, um, with that huge crazy search engine that I personally love so very much um, and you search for phase lock loop, what you're going to get back is about 10,000 parts available and they, the, the, they, they range from uh, uh, function to which pieces of the phase lock loop you can get in a single component and they run anywhere from you can get the whole shebang in one piece that you program and it outputs a frequency to you can just buy the separate pieces, right? And a lot of times what you find is that they are running, you know, even, even the mostly incorporated parts will run signals external to the part to get to the next stage. And the reason for that is so that you can insert all kinds of shenanigans in your design and make it do all kinds of wacky things. And we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, but it's, there, there's a lot of room for design and a lot of room for design errors. So I'm gonna try to get you up to speed on some of that. If you wanna go digging into this at the end, do it with a beverage and you got a lot of time, you can just go through the parts because there's a lot of them. Um, now, let's talk about the individual sections. The first thing we're gonna look at is the phase detector section, all right? Now, a phase detector proper is while it's what we've been calling it, it well, it's called a phase lock loop, right? So phase detector. Uh, thing is, a phase detector proper by itself is not a great thing to do this. And the reason is because your two reference frequencies have to be really, really close together for a phase detector by itself to work at all. So what you actually want, and what you actually have generally, is a phase frequency detector. Um, now, this circuit topology is not the only one available, but it seems to be a common topology. So I'm gonna talk about it and give you an idea of how this stuff works. Um, now, it is comprised of a pair of D flip-flops, okay? And the idea here, if I can get this right, 
is that if you assuming that you've got you know one one frequency here and another frequency there what you're going to get right your d's are held high and your clocks are there and it's driving the reset okay so your output is going to be a pulse coming out uh, from each of these guys and what happens is that the pulse either here or here as the case may be uh, is dependent on the phase relationship of these two guys, or optionally the frequency. If these things are particularly disparate numbers, uh, you will get an output here, and it will drive a charge pump. I didn't block this off. This is a charge pump. Very common to have a charge pump at the output of this thing. Um, and so what you have is a, either a, uh, a charge pump that is dumping current to your low pass filter, or your charge pump that uh, is sucking current from your low-pass filter. And of course, this explains the need for the low-pass filter, right? If you're driving this thing with a charge pump that just has pulses, you're gonna need to filter that sucker. Otherwise, you're gonna have wigginess on your VCO, okay? So, one of the other things I can tell you about is uh, uh, they introduce delay. There's like a little tiny delay bit right between this NAND gate and the resets of both of the D flip-flops. And the reason that is, is the dead zone effect. So check this out. See, if you, you knowledgeable guys, make sure that I'm doing this right. Um, when, when your input frequencies are really, really, when they're, when they're locked, right, if you don't have this delay here, you will not get an output at all. And in fact, this thing will be in a high Z state. As long as they're locked, the problem with that is that if you don't have any correcting signal here at all, the VCO will drift. Oh no! And in that drifting, you, you, I mean, you're gonna get spurs at your output frequency, and that's no good. So what they do is they put a little bit of delay here to ensure that they are getting some kind of correcting pulse, even when the phase and frequency are deadlocked, okay? you are almost certainly never gonna have to design a phase frequency detector um, or a charge pump for this purpose, right? This stuff all tends to exist, I think, universally? I haven't seen all the parts. There are 10,000 of them. Um, but this, this portion of the circuitry all exists in a monolithic package. Um, now, there are different topologies available. You will have to read data sheets to figure out which one works best for you. This is just one example, okay? Now, you will probably have to design a filter for this thing. Um, now, a lot, uh, the data sheets are going to walk you through this. It's not really that complicated. They want to sell parts to you, so they want to make this as easy as possible. And a lot of times, it's really just a single pole, an R and a C, and that's it. Um, but since these signals, as I said a little while ago, since these signals are oftentimes, maybe every time, uh, routed external to the chip, um, there's all kinds of room for shenanigans. So you don't have to go with a single pull. You could go with an active filter. You could go with something really wacky, depending on what you want your output to be. That's where your engineering skills come into play. Um, but you're never going to have to do this. Now, let's talk about the VCO. So the next section uh, is the voltage controlled oscillator, the VCO. This takes the output of the low pass filter and you have a voltage going in, you have a frequency going out, very simple. Now, um, in previous episodes of According to Pete, we've done oscillators, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth here. Um, but this can be uh, it's set with a lot of times uh, you can set it with uh, resistors and capacitors to give uh, to, to set the output frequency which is kind of suggestive that it is a relaxation oscillator so it's drifting a whole bunch which is why we do the phase lock loop in the first place because it's unstable uh, some are programmable some our our some are internal to the uh, phase lock loop proper some are external right so a lot of different options here. Again, if you go to DigiKey and you search for PLL, everything's gonna show up and it's gonna be nuts. Um, so that's that. Now the next section is um, the f uh, feedback. 
feedback, not the filter, the feedback. And that's where the magic sauce of how this thing works, I think, really comes into play. Um, this, is, this is the big thing, right? So we talked about earlier, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a really stable reference frequency in and then the exact same frequency out. That probably has limited value, I think. Uh, it would have limited value for me. So, the magic sauce happens in how we get the higher frequency back down to a lower frequency. Now, a lot of times, internal to um, a phase lock loop, you will get like some amount of div division back. But for example, if you've only got like a divide by two or something, that's complementary in the chip. Um, Everything, your, your VCO is only ever going to be twice your reference, okay? Or if you've got one programmable uh, divider, then your output frequency is only going to be multiples of your reference frequency, which is cool most of the time, some of the time, not very often, okay. So what they do, what is commonly done, is to use something called a dual modulus um, prescaler which is this topology. Now, this is not by any means the only way it's done. This is just one of the ways, but this is common, okay? Now let me describe how this works. Um, <laughs> you have several bits that you can program. You've got divide by M, divide by M plus one, so you can program what M is. Then you've got A and N, you can set those values. Now what happens? You've got your VCO that's making a really high frequency out here, okay? And when it starts counting, it is by default dividing by M plus one, M being some number that you set it to to divide your high frequency down. Now you've also got your N and your A. N is a number, an integer. A is a smaller integer than N. So when this thing starts counting, it's counting M plus one. Now, every time M plus one trips, oops, wait, that has to be an arrow there because it also does that. Every time M plus one trips, it counts A and N. And when it, as it's doing this, it counts down to A, and when it gets to A, it switches to M rather than M plus one, right? So you've got dual modulus, you divide them by two different things. And it will continue divide by, to divide by M until it reaches N, at which point uh, it clocks and the whole thing resets and it does it again. So in so doing, you've got a fairly, fairly intricate devising, devising, dividing scheme, and this will get you lots and lots of different frequencies that you can get out of your PLL. Um, and in fact, the, the, the equation for this is your F out equals your F reference times MN plus A. As I said, this is a common way to do it. But it's worth noting that since you are almost certainly going to have access to the feedback path of a PLL, that you can put all manner of nonsense in there and get all kinds of wackiness out. Now, just to recap some of the awesomeness of what this does, Right? These programmable values give you access to things like spread spectrum RF, right? Because you can set these very quickly and you can set your output to go all over the place, which is really cool if you need to do Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or any of those things. That's really awesome. The other thing is that you can generate lots and lots of different frequencies out of these divisors. So now you've got clock distribution for your microcontroller or your microprocessor, right? You've got different peripherals that need different scales from the reference clock and they all need to be very well synchronized. This is how it happens, right? So I want to make it clear, as, as esoteric as this may sound, this touches everyone's life. You don't even know it, but it impacts you and these are huge. And honestly, that's where we're gonna stop. Um, I haven't given you a lot, I've given you a lot of basic information. If you're gonna go design a phase lock loop, um, I probably haven't given you that much, but I think I've given you enough to like pick apart, maybe lay out a board, yada, yada, yada. So that's where we're gonna stop today. So to wrap up, um, if you would like to play with a phase lock loop and uh, see how they work and maybe try to make something, um, swap these two around. First, go to DigiKey. Uh, now, 
I choose DigiKey because I really like their search engine. A lot of people are like, oh, too many options, too many options. If you know what you're looking for, which you may not, uh, the search engine is really great. So when you do this and you search for phase lock lube, you're gonna be overwhelmed. So do this with uh, a relaxing evening in mind where you can assimilate a lot of information. Do it with your favorite beverage, maybe a bag of chips, take the phone off the hook or the turn off the ringer, otherwise, okay. Um, pick yourself out a couple of parts and then lay out a board, right? It's, I, I, I'm a big fan of like doing my own circuit building on a PCB without doing an actual layout. But my God, you can get, I just did two designs and submitted them to Osh Park for like 18 bucks for the two of them, including shipping. Why wouldn't you do this? So pick out a couple of parts, lay out a board with Eagle or KeyCAD, they take both. Um, and shout out to Osh Park, thanks for everything guys. Um, and play with it and see what happens. Now, the closest thing that we sell is not actually a phase lock loop. It is uh, the Mini Gen, which is breakout board BOB 11420. It is a uh, direct frequency synthesis part, uh, the AD 9837 from analog devices. It is not a phase lock loop, which is to say uh, it does not have a feedback path that makes sure that phase and frequency are exactly tracking. It just generates a higher frequency from a lower reference. Okay, but it's the closest thing we got. If you want to kind of poke around with divisors and junk like that, this board will do it for you. But eh, it's not really a phase lock loop. That's where we're gonna stop. Thank you for checking out ATP uh, this episode, March. Next time we're gonna do, uh, I think what's up is RS-485, right? So come back in a month. See you then, bye. a phase lock loop thing is, is, um, uh, you know what, I want to look at my thing. Yeah. <laughs> Electronics. No, you know what, let's do all of that again. <laughs> a lot of stuff, and I've already lost my train of thought. I'm just... And then... <laughs> Start again. The first thing we're going to look at is a, is, is the... One more time. We're all nerds. Aren't we all nerds? Yeah, you feel it here. A phase, a phrase. <laughs> Try that again. <laughs> For real this time.